such an honor to have you here. You have been a part of my life for 20 years since I first discovered your brilliant Pulitzer winning prize, How I Learned to Drive. And now, in just a couple of weeks, we get to celebrate your Broadway debut as a playwright after a long and storied career where you've won countless awards. You have several awards named after you that are given to other playwrights. And now, in this moment, you and Rebecca Tashman get to bring Indecent to, to Broadway. It's, it's incredible. Um, I have to say, I really enjoy uh, that my Broadway debut is a play named Indecent. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, it's been, uh, it's been an amazing journey to get to this moment in time. It is a play about a play. Yep. Uh, that play is called God of Vengeance yep. by the playwright Sholem Osh. It was written in 1907, I believe. Correct. And then what happened? Okay, so this 24-year-old newlywed man writes this. It's his first play, right? And uh, he presents it in a living room with all of these other Yiddish writers. And that evening, a fight breaks out. And the men in the room tell him, burn this play. This is a little play about a Jewish father and husband and he runs a brothel downstairs in his basement. And with the money, he is raising a pure Jewish girl. And he's bribing his daughter's way into society, including an engagement to a rabbi's son, mm -hmm. right? Only hitch is she falls in love with a woman downstairs. One of the, the prostitutes in the right. brothel, yeah. Right. And what's extraordinary is that when this was, was written and presented, the second act is this incredible love scene between these two women in this corrupt sexual world, uh, this kind of pure love, right? So what's interesting is that this little play uh, then goes on to Germany, becomes a kind of controversial hit all over Europe. It's all over the world. It's carried all over the world in Yiddish. It comes to New York. It plays here successfully for a couple of decades. Yiddish, Jewish audiences love it. And someone then gets the bright idea, let's translate this into English and present it on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And the entire cast is arrested for obscenity. So on opening night, on no On opening less. night, right, exactly. On did opening they have night. previews back then? Or they was did. This, so the previews went uh, unnoticed, and then opening night, the, the arrests were well, made? Well, during the previews, there was a vice cop who had seen it something like nine times, who had me was memorizing the entire script. And what's also kind of interesting is that, you know, Sholem Ash at this point became an internationally well-known writer of novels, primarily, right? So they arrested the cast, but they left him alone. And he really didn't have that much to do with the production. I believe, unbeknownst to him, when they moved it from Greenwich Village, it was off Broadway, up to Broadway, they censored the love story between the two women. But they left in the sex scene, right? They left in the sex scene, mm -hmm. that's right. So historically, this, is, this play was the first kiss between two women on the American stage in 1923. And we kind of look at the entire journey of this play all the way through World War II. Um, it's got a lot of twists and turns. And oh, by the way, there's a three-piece klezmer band in this troupe of actors that literally rise from the ashes, rise from the dust, to tell us this story. And it's this kind of amazing way, a way to look at the arts and America. How do we as Americans censor the arts? When do we censor the arts? When do we kind of check ourselves in terms of representation of the community, right? So um, it's perhaps uh, uh, got a lot more joy and music and comedy because, of course, we've got actors. We've got this troupe of actors moving us through time. So you have six actors, well, seven. Seven I guess. actors. Seven, right? You've got the guy who plays the stage manager, That's right. Lemel slash Lou, right. who is the narrator of the story. That's and then right. you have two young ingenue types, a man and a woman. You've got two, you call them middles. Yes. And then you have the elders. That's right. And they play all of the rest of the characters. That's I notice right. in the script, those, they're called the dead troop. Yes. Um, and I wondered where that came from. Um, that's never spoken, right? The, the name, it's the never, dead troop? It's never spoken, but I think when people see it, um, uh, I'm not going to say where it goes, uh -huh. but 
The director, Rebecca Tashman, is extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, I've been looking at her work for, oh, 15 years. And she literally has this troupe rising from the dead at the very beginning of the show. And they come to life, and they step forward, and they say, we have a story we want to tell you. So that's why we call them the dead troupe. Mm -hmm. That's where they come from. Yes. And they have to tell the story at every performance. You and Rebecca created this show together. You get um, double billing as creators, and then yes. you as writer, and she as director. But this came out of a college a graduate thesis program, uh, a graduate thesis, thesis uh, MFA, project yeah. that she was doing that That's was right. called The People Versus... Right. Uh, um, the, the People Versus God of Vengeance. God of Vengeance, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, right. The People um, Versus God of Vengeance. It's, it's an interesting thing. Um, I had a great opportunity last night to talk, do a talk back. They're presenting The God of Vengeance in town right now in Yiddish. And it's the second production. So... Uh, I was talking about this. People who find this play, it, it, it's been out of print, we kind of become groupies, mm -hmm. like sort of like Rocky Horror uh, or, <laughs> you know, Star Trek groupies. We find each other. I read it when I was 22 in a library. I couldn't put it down. I couldn't believe a man had written this love scene between two women. Mm -hmm. It was extraordinary. And so then I started noticing or hearing about this young woman who, for her dissertation in directing, actually staged the obscenity trial. And I started thinking, who is this woman? I've got to meet this woman. This is another groupie. <laughs> I started seeing everything of hers I could. And it's really remarkable directing work. And then out of the blue, seven years ago, she called me. And she said, this is kind of an improbable question, but would you be interested in writing a play about the god of vengeance? And I, it took me... I, I said yes before she finished her sentence. Um, and we've been working on it for seven years. Sundance, we've taken this production all across the United States. It's the same theater troupe yeah. that began the journey with us in New Haven. When we, most people say, right, and it's really true in the theater, we're family. Mm -hmm. We mean it literally. There have been two children conceived on the road wow. <laughs> who are now crawling around, you know, uh, will be crawling around backstage of the court theater. We are literally now family. It is so rare for a production to keep the same, not only the creatives, but also the cast among so many different productions. Yes. How has that allowed you more freedom to work with each other, to trust each other, than if you had been replacing actors along the way? Well, it's, there really is a short hand. But you know, the other thing is that I feel that this is a, a Valentine and a love letter to the theater. Mm -hmm. um, and so to have these actors commit this amount of time, um, every time we go back, they get deeper and deeper and deeper. And I have to say, I, I, mean, I mean, I'm a little chagrined to say this, but I've never done so many rewrites in my, my life. I heard there are 40 plus drafts. There are 40 plus drafts. And the reason why when you get the honor to work with the same group of actors, you want to tailor each character to that actor, mm -hmm. right? And I started seeing what Max Gordon Moore could do, and I, and I thought, I could invent, you know, a Eugene O'Neill scene for him, because mm -hmm. he's in the story, too. So I just kept working, because as you go along, this is a spectacular cast. Uh, Katrina Lank, Rich Topol, uh, Mimi Lieben, um, Adina Verson, Max Gordon Moore, I forget, uh, uh, Steve Rattazzi, Plus, we have, from the get-go, traveling with us, the three musicians. Oh, and they're so fantastic. Two of them are composers of the score, and they're actually members of the troupe. So everybody dances. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody sings. Um, it's this incredible wash of music that just hurdles us through time. So I saw this show off-Broadway at the Vineyard Theater yeah. uh, about eight months ago, um, you have had a break since that production, and this one starts previews on April 4th. For those people who saw it at the Vineyard, what will be different about the Broadway production? What will be different about the Broadway production is, um, you know, I, I remember um, hearing about Lin-Manuel and Hamilton, mm -hmm. and how in between the public and moving it to Broadway, they continued to refine it, and that's what we've done. It's like we don't want to waste a second. 
Um, oftentimes, I have this expression, you know, I'm going to go into the theater, I'm going to be two hours closer to death when I get out of the theater. <laughs> Please make sure I'm so happy that I spent every moment of my two hours in this theater, in this play. And that's what we're doing together in the room, making sure that there's not a wasted movement or moment. Um, and a lot has changed in the resonance of this play. Certainly. I mean, it's a story of immigrants. It's a story of narrative and censorship. And that's certainly something we are all... We are all thinking about right now, I heard a beautiful speech you gave at BroadwayCon uh, recently where yeah. you said, in the same way that this play, God of Vengeance, was a statement that we are all Jewish, we are all lesbian, now it's saying we are all Muslim. Yes, yeah. And it really, you know, in, in this period in time, and it's, it's useful, we had been thinking about this, it's the reason we said yes, let's go forward on this journey, is that there is a kind of toxic atmosphere. There was a toxic atmosphere seven years ago, eight years ago. This, you know, whatever has happened in terms of the division between us didn't just happen overnight. It's mm -hmm. been there for a while. So looking at this moment in time when it was a perfect storm, uh, the KKK was growing its membership in the United States. There was false news planted in newspapers paid for by a very rich man the Koch brothers of his time, Henry T. Ford, wrote in newspapers that Jews were an international conspiracy, taking over the government, taking control of banking, polluting the arts. I mean, terrifying fake news out there. And of course, the homophobia, and of course, the anti-Semitism. It was kind of a perfect storm, right? Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting moment for us. When we travel around the country with this, depending on the audience, the, one of the things that I've been so moved uh, to hear on the West Coast from Latino, Latina audience members is that this is my family. Wow. This is about my family. What does it mean to become American? What, how must we fight? How do we hold on to our culture, right? Um, so very much we were aware that this is a celebration mm -hmm. of immigration. What makes us American is all of those voices yeah. and not suppressing those voices. Um, and I'm hoping that we're not breaching, but we may be, again, the perfect storm in terms of the anti-Muslim rhetoric, in terms of going backwards, in terms of women's rights, in terms of gay rights, right? Anti-Semitism on the rise. We really have to come together as a community in this moment of time, and that's what theater does. What a perfect moment for it to come to Broadway. I've also spent the last few days rereading some of your plays and uh, rereading the script from Indecent, and I am really fascinated by the parallels between your struggles, your uh, career path, and that career path of the playwright Sholem Ash. This is, uh, like you're both playwrights who started very young, writing right. about very controversial subjects. Um, one of which was lesbianism. Uh, you both had a long road getting to Broadway, had, <laughs> had a celebrated off-Broadway runs. Um, I want to talk about the fact that you have so many works, most notably How I Learned to Drive, that didn't make it to Broadway, and what it means to you to be uh, making that debut at this point in your career and with this play in particular. Right. I mean, one of the, the things I feel we have to do as young people looking ahead, right, maybe in love with what you're doing, how do you sustain that? You can't sustain it with bitterness. You can't sustain it with competition and comparisons with other people who get to where you want to be faster than you do, right? So you have to kind of concentrate on loving the process. One of the processes I've really loved is working with other writers. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that I've stopped from being bitter is to work with young writers, try to sustain them, sort of try to be their first agent, try to get my, my mind blown generationally by what they can do on the page. How could I do that? And try to learn from them, right? And that's kept me for 50 years sort of thinking, I've got to write the next play in response to one of those writers, interestingly enough. And, and the other thing I've, I've been saying to every writer I work with, you enter as a student, you're going to exit the door as a peer, and you have to teach me. Most of all, I want to make sure you get done before I did. I want to make sure you get to Broadway before I did, right? 
Um, and I, I guess because this is uh, a play with a Jewish troupe, I get to Cavell. Four of my playwrights have won the Pulitzer, right? I have been at opening nights of Milo Cruz's play. I have been there when Kiara Houdis went to Broadway. I was there opening night on Broadway when Sarah Rule. And Sunday, I will be there when the first undergraduate that I ever produced, she was 20 years old, Lynn Nottage, is produced with her amazing play, Sweat. The truth of the matter is theater is not a blood sport. Theater is a community, right? So what's kept me alive for 50 years is wanting to be in the community. There's another expression we say, die, day, die, die, anu, right? We say it, we sing it during uh, Passover. That would have been enough. To spend my life with these amazing writers, to spend my life seeing these remarkable actors, two of the actors in our troupe, um, I worked with when they were students at Yale School of Drama, right? Dai Dai Ainu. It's just extraordinary. And so I'm, I'm kind of thrilled to still be in their community and in their company. Um, I, I am also, when I say this is a love letter to the theater and it's a love letter to actors, it's a love letter to my playwrights, to the young 24-year-olds who come into the room. And they write incendiary plays. They write plays that are going to set the world on fire. And I'm there sort of going, this is great, this is great. Don't burn the theater down while you're setting the world on fire. How do you do that balancing act? So this, this, is, a, you know, this is my love letter back mm -hmm. to all of these writers who've sustained me. I want to also acknowledge another major milestone for you, which is that you are now Dr. Paula Vogel. <laughs> How many years was it between when you started your graduate work and when you finished your thesis? I was 22 years old when I started my graduate work. Now listen, I, you know, it's kind of also, when I, when I stop and I think of everything I have to be grateful for. Um, my father left home when I was 10. We grew up below the poverty level. So the fact that my brother and I were the first people in our family to go to college. Um, you know, I started off as a secretary and a factory worker. And the fact that this is how I, what, what I get to call my living. Mm -hmm. I get up every day and I go into a rehearsal room. How nice is that for a job? So I was in graduate uh, school. It's where I discovered I love to teach. Um, but let's just say that I was tossed out, um, and as I Wait, left, you were, they, they asked you to leave? You didn't leave by choice? They, I spent three years writing a dissertation, and, uh, my committee had retired and resigned, and they were replaced by their political enemies, who then took the dissertation that took me three years and said, start all over on page one. Wow. And I said, I won't. And they said, you have 24 hours to clean out your office. I was teaching playwriting. I was in school. And um, in 24 hours, I left Ithaca and Cornell, um, moved to New York. Uh, you know, the usual illegal sublets, three jobs, um, starving, pawning my grandmother's watch, et cetera. We've, yeah. So many of us are there probably right now. And uh, I just thought I'll never in hell go back to Cornell. Lo and behold, the story reached the ears of these young faculty members who said, this, we, wanna, we wanna write this. So they asked me if I would come back and if they could be my graduate committee. Now, mind you, I've already been teaching for 30 years, graduate uh -huh. students. But I went, what a kick. How fantastic. And they said, can you go back to your original thesis? I said, it's in the library at Yale. <laughs> I don't even think I can uncover it. And they said, how about indecent as your thesis play? You spent seven years of research write a critical essay. So on opening night, my graduate mentor, Sarah Warner, um, this wonderful professor who is in her 40s, is going to be at opening night of Indecent. And I, I'm just going to be able to say to her, how many of your dissertations have ended up on Broadway? Uh -huh. Congratulations. Thank I, you. I, I love that story so much. The greater delayed, the greater delighted is one of my favorite sayings. And one of mine is that nothing worth getting isn't worth sweating over. So, um, <laughs> yep. so I, I'm, I'm glad we got to touch on that. I also want to, uh, to go back. You briefly mentioned your brother. Yes. Um, and this year marks the 25th anniversary of the play you wrote uh, as a love letter to him. Yes. Uh, the Baltimore Waltz. Right. Um, and uh, I know that you're traveling to celebrate the 25th 
anniversary of that play. Yeah. How does it um, remain in your consciousness, in your heart, and what does the, the continued production of that play mean to you? It, it actually means, I think, more than the other plays I've written. And the reason why is that, you know, I had been caretaker of my older brother. My older brother, in, in essence, fathered me. He was the one who said, go to college, you have a mind. He was the one that gave me sexual politics by Kate Millett and said, you know, you have a mind, to use it. Uh, and uh, he uh, called me when he was diagnosed with HIV. So I became his caretaker. And um, I was in a tenure track, and they said, you have to write another play. And I was frozen with grief, and I thought, I can't write. But I went to this wonderful place, the McDowell Colony, and they put me in a cabin, and I looked on the wall. On the wall at McDowell are the names of all of the artists, all of them, most of them starving artists, who are taken in by McDowell. And on the wall, I saw, I saw Thornton Wilder's signature. I slammed the door, and my brother, right before he died, had asked me to take a trip to Europe with him. And I thought, I can't afford that. I didn't realize he was HIV positive. So I got into the cabin and I wrote about this imaginary trip to Europe. One of the things that I hadn't realized at this point, I was in my late 30s, was that theater is always in the present tense, mm. right? My brother was in the past tense, but I could write, Carl is going to Europe. Carl goes to the Louvre, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that right now actors are using my brother's name in the present tense, and have all over the world, is astonishing. Yeah. Well, I know that he will be with you and um, present at your opening night of Indecent. And if anyone's at the Magic Theater, please, this is going to be I, I, just a beautiful love letter um, from this company. Uh, we do have time for a few questions from Great. the audience. Great. Hi. Hi, Paula. Thank you Hi. for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, so I love that you mentioned uh, censorship before. It's, I think, something that writers feel is so threatening, especially in you know, the current political climate. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what advice would you have for you know, a young writer who maybe feels pressured by being censored in their writing, whether it's you know, plays, music, whatever? Uh, there is always a censorship. It's benign. We don't notice it until certain movies don't win the Academy Award or aren't right, nominated for the Academy Award. What a loss if those artists hadn't made that movie, right? It's, it's a strange paradox right now. We need writing right now to go all the way out more than we have at any time in my lifetime, right? So if you have the heart and the guts and the brain to write it, the producing of it is easy. It may be that there are gatekeepers. We can do it on the streets. We can do it in the living room. Do you know what I mean? This we can do it in a basement. We can do it in the basement. <laughs> that's I mean, right. That's exactly. the lesson of this show. Like, yeah. It starts there, it ends there. It starts there, it ends there. So please don't censor your sh yourself, right? Um, you'll have all around you a community that makes sure that your voice gets through. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Um, Hi. As a writer, I'm wondering how you decide that your writing is done and you no longer want to edit, you no longer want to add things, and it says exactly what you want it to say. Uh, sometimes the director, like Rebecca Tashman, has to take my laptop away from me. <laughs> um, and sometimes it's like the actors say, we can't memorize anything new before opening night. Here's the thing that I kind of feel, and it's, I think it's great. Plays are never finished. Novels maybe, poems maybe, short stories maybe, but the truth of the matter is you're writing something that should and will be changed a hundred years, we hope, after you die, right? And it has to fit the time. The play doesn't belong to you, it belongs to the audience. So in a way, it's a question of when can you turn it over? You can go back two or three years after you write it with a new company and a new group of actors and change it, but let the audience have it. Does that make sense? So I believe in turning it over while it's still incomplete. There will never be such a thing as a play that is, is finished. Cool. Thank you. I love that answer so much. I try to be a real uh, advocate for audience as collaborator, yeah. and I'm not sure that anyone's ever stated it quite like you have, and I appreciate that so much as, as an audience member myself. <laughs> yeah, so thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Do we have another question? 
Hello. Hi. I wanted to know, as a woman, since there aren't many women who are behind the scenes in entertainment, writing or producing, um, was there a moment in your career where you really felt backlash specifically because you were a woman or you felt that it may have held you back? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And um, one of the things that I've really loved is uh, an opportunity to share notes with Lynn Nottage. I want to give just a little statistic. When I started writing in the 1970s, over 50% of playwrights were women, right? Um, only 16% of all plays produced were, were written by women. Now, we've had progress. We're up to 22%, right? Um, the statistics for writers of color are grimmer still, right? So have we felt that? Have we felt it directly? Have people said extraordinary things to my face? Absolutely. I want to thank whatever ancestor of mine it was that gave me this gene. If you shut me out of your club, I am not going away. That's the gene I have. You know what I mean? And it becomes funny after a while. I'm kind of, I'm very proud of all my rejection letters. I save them. <laughs> and whenever younger writers get rejection letters, I'm like, let me, give me the rejection letter. I'm going to do an interpretive dance <laughs> of your rejection letter so that you can kind of enjoy it. Do you know what I mean? Because it just gives you a little wind at your sails to prove them wrong and to kind of shame them and you all know who you are <laughs> out there. Thank you so much. You know what I mean? But um, the, the truth of the matter, and I really, really mean this, I would not have continued mentoring playwrights if I did not know this is a, an astonishing time of talent. Astonishing. Well, it is an astonishing time for theater. I'm so glad that you are part of this Broadway season at long last. You are, you're coming to the big stage. Yes. Um, <laughs> although I don't think anyone was under the impression you needed it to cement your place uh, as one of America's greatest playwrights. It is a true Thank honor uh, to spend this time with you. And I want to go back to uh, the, the tweet that I wrote when I saw Indecent Off-Broadway the first time, um, this is theater at its most brilliant, its most essential, and uh, I, can't, I can't recommend Indecent more highly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paula. Thanks for this time.